You know, Wednesday, my wife and I were supposed to be hopping on a plane and heading to Israel and meeting our group over there. Two days later, I usually go over early if I can and sit down with the guide and kind of make sure everything's uh, on schedule. And of course, last Saturday, all those plans got, got changed. But, but I thought I would just, before we get into our scripture, talk a little bit about what's going on in Israel and, and in our world. I, I've been over to Israel about 12 times, taken groups over, been over. My first trip was just me and uh, three other pastors in a minivan, and we spent uh, about 10 days over there just going around and looking at all the sites. Uh, Last Saturday was the 50th anniversary of Yom Kippur War in Israel in 1973. The war was launched by their Arab neighbors who caught Israel completely by surprise. And history repeats itself. Saturday, over 3,000 rockets were launched indiscriminately into the nation of Israel from Gaza Armed terrorists crossed the border in several areas, uh, created really mass hysteria, murder, uh, the murder of children, babies, elderly people, many hostages, over 1,200 dead. I, I think the number has risen since I wrote this. Up to 22 Americans. And we have uh, Israeli, now, the Israeli government now making a declaration of war. Uh, this radical terrorist group, Hamas, there on the West Bank in Gaza, planned and carried out their murderous attack on Israel. I don't know if you've watched it, if you've seen the news. It's, it's uh, cruel, it's despicable, it's too insane for me to even want to try and verbally describe what happened, other than to say this, it's almost, in my opinion, demonic, is what they, what they did. And before we get into our text, let me just give a brief description of my understanding of what, what we have. Uh, the Jewish nation, on one side, a sovereign state of Israel, and on the West Bank, uh, a Palestinian state. Gaza is not occupied by the Israelis. In 2005, the Israelis completely left Gaza, gave it over to the Palestinians who have elected Hamas Hamas to be the ruling governing body in that area. Most Palestinians and other Arab nations, not all, but many, if you, if you know the history and the situation, pretty much deny the right of Israel to exist. They don't believe Israel is legitimate. They have believed this way all the way back before it was born again, if you will, back in 1948. Back in 1948, the United Nations declared Israel a sovereign nation. They had been scattered for 2,000 years. And I believe because of the atrocity of the Nazi Holocaust, they, they partitioned the land into a Jewish and Arab state. The Jews obviously accepted. No Arab nation agreed to this situation. In fact, on the day after Israel became a nation, May 14, 1948, on May 15th, Israel was attacked, but Israel survived. In 1967, Egypt's President Gamal Nasser attacked Israel. Syria attacked, Lebanon attacked, Iraq attacked, and Jordan attacked. And once again, Israel survived. Hamas has a charter that proposes the destruction of Israel. And, I, and I, I may have something I'm gonna throw up here. here, here it is. There is no solution for the Palestinian question. This is from the ha Hamas Covenant Charter, Article 13, 1988. There's no solution for the Palestinian question except through jihad. Initiatives, proposals, and international conferences are all a waste of time and vain endeavors. We want Israel destroyed. Israel, I don't believe, created the situation we're in right now. And, and some of you might disagree with this. I'm, I'm not a, a real uh, political 
preacher, if you've been around for a while, I don't get into politics and situations. But I am into Israel, and I think God is too. The nation of Israel is the size of the state of New Jersey, if you want to get an idea of how big it is. Think about the United States of America, the size of our country, and then think of a little bitty New Jersey. That's the size of the nation of Israel, the size of one of our smallest states. But over and over again, our, our world news focuses on Israel. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse 3, it says, And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for, for all peoples. All who would have it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. Zechariah made this prophecy. And the Bible predicts over and over again that Israel becomes the center of attention. Now, right now, and please listen, we don't have Ezekiel 38 and 39. We don't, don't have nation against nation. We have Israel against a terrorist group out of Gaza called Hamas. In Ezekiel, in the end times, the war is nation against nation. Now, this incident could lead there all the way to the Ayatollahs in Iran. And America, as you know, has sent its warships there to help protect. But, but in Ezekiel, the prophecy, no nation stands with Israel. They're all alone. That's what the Bible predicts. But God himself will be with Israel. And I think God's pretty capable. Amen. The situation could produce a worldwide situation. Hamas is funded by Iran, the ancient Persia, and the Ayatollahs of Tehran and Israel. They come against it. They, they call Israel little Satan. And guess what they call America? Great Satan. And, and this is something I don't understand. I'm not trying to be political here. I really don't understand this. One of our former presidents, Obama, and I'm not a political preacher, gave $1.2 billion in cash to Iran and, and promised billions more until Trump canceled that policy. But now our current president, Joe Biden promises six billion to Iran, one of the largest sponsors of terrorism on the planet. You say, but John, it's for humanitarian purposes. I know. <laughs> this Hamas terrorists were trained by Russians, and Russians have said they'll support Palestinians if we support Israel. So, so what's our posture? Well, I, I think number one, pray. You know, Wednesday night, I have a, have a men's group that meets over in the uh, family room. And I encourage you guys to stay involved. And there's a women's group that meets over in the coffee house that my wife and daughter are leading. And so we, we both ended our, our group a little early Wednesday night, and all the men came over into the women's Bible study, and we just spent probably about 15, 20 minutes together praying for Israel. I, I think one of our first postures is, is to pray. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. In Psalm 122, verse 6, it, it, it tells us, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. We've been called to do that. So, so one of the things I, I think that, that our response would be is to pray. Another one would be this. Stay aware of what's going on around you and in your world. Many of you know we have an unsecured southern border in our country and tens of thousands of immigrants from all areas, including Middle East cultures, 
are coming into America. We don't know who they are, and for the most part, we don't know where they are. It's a crazy time in our world. Another thing I would say to you, not only to, to pray, not only to be aware, but stay in the Bible. Stay in the scriptures. Don't become a lazy Christian. Stay strong. Stay, stay strong in your faith. And, and, and in this divided nation that we live in, where, where more and more we have this kind of duplicit culture that we function in. See, he, he, here's, here's America now, it seems to me, and maybe it's not this, this black and white, but there's a, a Bible-believing, moral, pro-Israel, God-fearing populace in our country. But there's also an anti-biblical woke world in our country that doesn't even have the wisdom to understand the difference between male and female gender. This is the country we live in. There's transgender, there's same-sex marriage, there's drag queen things going on in our public schools, there's abortion, there's legalized drug addiction, and I could go on and on and on. We live in this very duplicit culture and this issue of Israel, I believe, will be and is focused on both sides of our media. You've got a conservative media, you've got a very liberal media. And so what we're going to see, based on what's happening, you're going to see all kinds of pro-Palestinians, groups raising their head, anti-Semitism, pro-Israel. And you cannot study the history of Israel and not believe that Israel has a God of miracles on their side. 400 years of slavery under Egypt, and God miraculously delivers them with Moses. They're outnumbered completely. Two total destructions of their nation in biblical history. Multiple deportations in foreign nations. 2,000 years of being despised and scattered, a holocaust where over 6 million of their people were slaughtered and mistreated, born again in 1948, war in 1967, war in 1973, and guess what, war in 2023. But God is not asleep. In Psalm 122, verse 4, it says, Behold, who, who, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor slumber nor sleep. You know, there's an interesting parable in, in the book of Matthew, chapter 25, where you have these ten virgins who are, are waiting for the bridegroom. And they fall asleep. And the bridegroom arrives. Five of them have oil, five don't. Five are ready, five are real, five are posers. And I think I have to ask myself over and over again, John, which one are you? It's time to, to raise our level of commitment to the Lord, our, our love for him, our understanding of him. And, and I think Neil shared just a minute ago that uh, what a coincidence that we're in Mark chapter 13 today. I, I didn't plan it. The God who neither sleeps nor slumbers. <laughs> Listen to what it says. I mean, we have this same story, this same uh, uh, passage of Scripture in, in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 and here in Mark 13. And it, it's all the same of Jesus on the Mount of Olives speaking about end time events. And this is the longest sermon that Mark records of Jesus in his entire gospel. I don't think it's by accident. I think it's because of content and, and because of significance. Then as he, speaking of Jesus, Mark 13, verse 1, went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and, and what buildings are here. Now, now Jesus is going to talk about what's going to happen with the temple in the near future. And he's going to talk about what's going to happen with a temple in the distant future. Uh, prophecy in scripture, uh, 
will many times include not only present condition, but also future condition. It's all through the Old Testament. It's all through the New Testament. Near future and distant future and the end of the age. These disciples are thinking just about their lifetime. But Jesus is going to deal with now and then. You know, if you've been following along with us in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus has cleansed the temple. Jesus had said some pretty intense things about the temple, about its leaders. He, he, he questions what, what's going on in the temple. It's, it's, it's desolate in his mindset. Religious and political leaders and, and, and have come and, and questioned Jesus' authority. We, we saw that last week and the week before. And Jesus now makes his way from the temple across this small valley called the Kidron Valley and up to the Mount of Olives, where if you stand on the Mount of Olives and look back toward the temple, look back toward the Temple Mount, it, it rises up before you and it's, it's, a, it's an amazing, wonderful view. And so Jesus, here he is. He went out of the temple Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus said to him, do you, do you see these great buildings? It's history, pal. He says, not one stone will be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, now I would submit to you that, that the temple in those days was considered one of the great wonders of the world, sitting there on top of Mount Moriah over the entire city of Jerusalem. From a distance, it looked like a mountain of gold. It had massive gates plated with gold and silver, nine of them, and white marble stone. And so if you were to come over the hill from, from Bethany and, and see the temple, it would be, if the sun was shining down on it, it would be like a fiery, uh, amazing, beautiful picture in your heart. Josephus, the historian of that time, Describe the temple like this, all sides covered in gold, and as the sun shone on it, it was like a fiery flash, white marble stones, stones that were 67 and a half feet long, and, and, and some of them nine feet in height. And Jesus had said some pretty tough things about the temple. So I think the disciples are pointing it out to him. It, it, it's majesty. I mean, the, the temple mount covered over 36 acres, giant retaining walls. Jewish people believed the temple, as long as it was there in their midst, gave assurance of God's protection, God's favor, and a sign of his blessing and his presence. So as long as that temple was there, hey, we're okay. And so they're coming out. Jesus had said some really difficult things about the leadership, about the temple. And so they say, Lord, look, look, look at the teacher. See what manner of stones and what buildings are here. Now, you've got to remember that the disciples are from this little fishing village of Capernaum around Galilee. They don't have buildings like this in Galilee. They don't have anything near the, the splendor and the majesty of this temple that sits up there. And, and they're, they're now in Jerusalem with Jesus. It's the third time they've come for Passover. And Jesus responds, yeah, take a good look. It's all going to be gone. Not a single stone will be left. That, that would be like you and me coming out of Washington, D.C. and going, wow. Wow. Look at the White House, the, the Washington Monument. Look at the Capitol building. Isn't this amazing? And someone saying to you, with great authority that, you, that you've left everything to follow, oh yeah, none of that will be here. It's all going to be gone. Well, in 70 AD, the Romans responded to a Jewish rebellion and literally destroyed the temple. The story is told that uh, they were not to destroy it, but some soldier threw a, a, a fire brand into the temple. It caught fire. And, and all the gold, it was such an intense fire. It must have been like 
what happened in Lahaina recently, it's just mind blowing. All the gold melted into the cracks of the stones. If you know anything about uh, the Romans and their conquests, the, the soldiers get to take the spoils. So they literally tore the temple down stone by stone to scrape the gold out between the cracks and crevices. If you go to Israel today, you can see some of the ancient stones still rolled down into the valley from that destruction. So, so Jesus is, is, is coming out of, of that, that temple mount, making his way across the Kidron Valley over to the Mount of Olives. Now as he sat, verse 3, on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to him privately. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? Now, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives probably because just on the other side of it, not towards the temple, but the other side, is the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And that's where Jesus has been renting a VRBO for the last few weeks. That's where he hung out. And the disciples are looking at the, the temple, this predominant figure in the landscape, so, so they ask these three questions. Now, now I want you to listen, I want you to, to, to understand, uh, there's some basic concrete beliefs that the Jewish people shared about the end times. Number one was that there would be great turmoil in the world and especially in Israel at the end times. They, they knew this from their prophecies. And so right now they're being dominated by Rome they're under the heavy boot of taxes and laws and restriction. Their, their whole country is occupied by enemies. And there's major tension and turmoil constantly in Israel because of it. They, they also believe that, that a prophet would rise up, a forerunner, and would announce the Messiah. And John the Baptist had, had come on the scene and, and, and people were going in droves so much so that the religious leaders finally went out to the Jordan to, to see this man. And, and we know that John the Baptist was being debated even to the time when they asked him recently here in the Gospel of Mark, John, John's baptism, was it of God or, or was it of man? And when Jesus wouldn't answer their question. They feared the people because it says the people believed that John was a prophet of God. So, so in the Jewish mindset, at the end of times, they believed there'd be turmoil. They believed there'd be a forerunner prophet. And then the Messiah would come and establish his kingdom and defeat his enemies. And that the Jewish people would return from places they had been taken to through the Babylonian exile and others, and, and, and scattered, and the kingdom of God would begin. So, so, so here's the thing, listen. Number one, they're in turmoil. Number two, there's been a forerunner. And number three, the Messiah has come riding in on a donkey as prophesied in Zechariah chapter nine. And now they're thinking, all right, The kingdom's about to be established, but, but wait a minute. This, this temple destruction, Jesus, this doesn't, fit, this doesn't fit into our understanding of the Bible. This doesn't fit into our understanding of what's supposed to happen. And so Jesus begins to answer. When will these signs be fulfilled? And Jesus says, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. One of the biggest signs of the last days is spiritual and biblical heresy and deception. Number one, there is and always will be the ongoing spiritual battle. Let me ask you a question. Do you think we live in an age of deception? false doctrine, or we could call it fake doctrine. 
false teachers, fake teachers, false leaders, fake teachers, false news, fake news, ends ultimately with as described in the book of Daniel as Antichrist who will deceive the whole world. The primary tool or tactic of the enemy is deception. It started all the way back in the garden. Has God really said? Oh, you, you can eat that. You'll, you'll not surely die. He, he, he says there's going to be great deception. We, we live in a time, I think, where we have the greatest deception going on in the minds and the hearts of people in a nation that once trusted in God and now drifted very far. For nation will, will, well, but when you hear of wars, verse 7, and rumors of wars, don't be troubled. For such things must happen, but the end's not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be earthquakes in various places. There'll be famines, troubles. These are the beginning of sorrows. Wars and reports of wars. Earthquakes, famines, beginning of sorrows. And some translations that, that has been translated properly and I think very well, uh, labor pains, birth pains. Well, we, you say, well, we've always had these wars and earthquakes. But birth pains, our birth pains, our labor pains, uh, are, are a very distinctive, I think, way of explaining because if you've ever, I've never had a child, but I witnessed three getting born. And when labor pains become more intense and closer together, you know the baby's just around the corner, right? I remember when our first child was born, and uh, I'll never forget this because Lynn had to be induced. My, my wife has, has such a strong personality <laughs> that I think she would not allow herself to go into labor. So they induced her. And when the labor pains started coming, and they got closer together and more intense, I'll never forget one of the things. I'm, I'm standing there holding her hand, and she cried out, Jesus, I thought you were going to be with me. <laughs> and I, and I, I say, he's here, he's here, he's here. <laughs> and then soon after, there was a little baby boy. They got closer and closer and more intense, and the baby was born. I, I think we all watch the news, and we see things happening in such rapidity. Over and over again, there, there, there's this giant Afghanistan earthquake that just occurred. There's Ukraine. There's what's going on in Israel. There's been the Sudan. There's been Syria. There's been Uganda. There's been Yemen. There's been Ethiopia. There's been Iran. And then there's our own government that is vastly divided. It seems we're in the midst of birth pains, and they seem to be getting closer and closer and closer. Jesus goes on as he's describing the end of the age. He says, but watch out for yourselves. They'll deliver you up to councils. You'll be beaten in the synagogues. You'll be brought before rulers and kings for my name's sake, for testimony to them. And the gospel must be first preached to all nations. And keep in mind, as Jesus describes prophecy, as the Bible describes prophecy, it deals with now and it deals with then. You will be persecuted and hated. And, and, and this, this verse about the gospel being preached, it's, it's interesting. And, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. So some people has taken that verse out of context, I believe, and said, well, Jesus can't come back until the gospel's been preached to all the world. I, I don't think that's the, the center of, of the context of what Jesus is saying here. I think what he's saying here is in the midst of persecution, in the midst of difficulty, in the midst of intimidation, 
don't stop preaching the gospel. It must be preached. Some people have pulled this out of context and said, well, Jesus can't come back like we can keep Jesus from coming back without sharing the gospel. Let's bring him back. I think he's in charge of that. The context is don't let hardship, difficulty stop the church from sharing the good news of the gospel. Most of this will take place in the time of tribulation. And in the time of tribulation, if you know the book of Revelation, and we studied that recently, there will be great sharing of the gospel by the two witnesses, by 144,000 servants of the Lord who are, who are Jewish evangelists. Do you know any Jews who got saved? These guys share the gospel. It's like 144,000 apostle of Paul's that, that rise up to share the gospel across the world. And, and not only that, but an angelic messenger in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, who, who flies throughout the skies sharing the gospel. And that, I believe, is the fulfillment of this verse, that the gospel will be shared. And it goes on, and it says in, in, in verse 11, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, don't worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak, but whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now, now keep this in context as well. In the end times, in times of persecution, it's, it's, it's not a passage of Scripture that says you don't ever have to study the Bible or if you're a pastor, prepare because the Holy Spirit will just lead you. You know, kind of get up there and turn the garden hose on and just let it run. No. It's not a Scripture for lazy Christians or preachers. Study to show thyself approved. Jesus is answering their questions and, 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 and he says, now brother will betray brother to death and father his child and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death Jesus is is answering this 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 second question and you will be hated by all for my name's sake but he who endures to the end will be saved so when you see verse 14 the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing where it ought not let the reader understand then that those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. In Daniel, we have this phrase about the abomination of desolation three times. The idea of the abomination of desolation is someone or something placed in the temple or place of worship to cause it to be made desolate, sacrilege. Historically, in 167 or 168, Antichius Epiphany, his name means illustrious one or, or incarnation of Zeus, a Seleucid king, came into Jerusalem, stopped the sacrifices. And let me stop this sacrifice right here. Are, are you guys still with me? Okay, because you're really quiet. <laughs> stop, stop the sacrifices dedicated an altar to Zeus there in the Jewish temple, sacrificed a pig on the altar, forbade Sabbath, forbade circumcision, and on his attack of Jerusalem, killed 80,000 Jews and took 40,000 as slaves. Jesus is not referring to this. He's referring to a future event. This happened historically, but Jesus also points to a future event in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This is in the end times. In, in, in verse 15 of our passage, let him who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter, nor take anything into his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. 
But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing in those days, and pray that your flight may not be in the winter. Speaking specifically here about Jews in Jerusalem, Israel. Antichrist, the the son of perdition, will will affect the whole world, but it'll be centered. Listen, it'll be centered in Israel. And, And it brings us back to our constant attention that's being brought back to Israel over and over again. This little bitty nation that has miraculously survived war after war after war, scattered for 2,000 years the size of New Jersey. Israel, a cup of trembling, but, but it will be protected. For in those days, verse 19, there will be tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor shall ever be. This will be the time of great tribulation. I believe the church is gone. And unless the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. For the elect's sake whom he chose, he shortened those days. God has set time limits on the great tribulation. This is not a tribulation for man. This is God's judgment in the end times. I believe the church is raptured before this. We we looked at this back in our study of the book of Revelation not long ago. The, The great tribulation, in my opinion, is a powerful collision of of one, God's wrath. Number two, Satan's hatred of mankind and God. And number three, man's final rebellion here on earth. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, verse 21, or look, here, here, he is here, don't believe. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed. I have told you all these things beforehand. But in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. Stars of heaven will fall and the powers in heaven will be shaken. Cosmic disorder that precede the coming of the Lord. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and with great glory. And then he will send an angels and gather his elect from the four winds from the farthest parts of the earth to the farthest parts of heaven. I say all that, and then Jesus says it as well. Jesus Christ is coming back. Amen. He's coming back. And over and over again, I don't know the outcome of what's going to happen with this, this thing with Israel right now, but you know what? First time something like this has happened in almost 50 years, and Jesus is coming back. Disciples didn't understand, but one coming of Messiah. That's where their focus was. That they believed that the Messiah was only coming once. We know there's a second coming. And Jesus, you'll see next week, shares a parable to keep them awake about a fig tree that represents Israel. And so, so, so I, I say all this to, to say this to you, to me. Stay prayerful. Stay awake. We, 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 we live in, in, in such an a, 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 a indulged, duplicit culture that I'm sorry to say that most Christians have fallen asleep. They don't go to Bible studies. They don't read the scripture. They spend more time watching news and movies than they do praying and coming to Bible studies and sharing their faith. They're asleep. Stay in the word. Stay in the Bible. And finally, if you'll do those things, stay strong in the Lord. If this thing heads where it possibly could head, you're going to need to be prayerful, aware in the word, and to be strong in the Lord. And you know what? I would say this as well. 
our country, our culture, our state, your neighborhood, your neighbors need a Christian around them that'll tell them the truth about what's happening in our world. We need people to wake up and become the body of Christ. To, to, to maintain those kind of commitments that they've made in the past. To do those things that the Lord has called us to do and called us to be. Because Jesus Christ, we don't know the hour nor the day, but I can tell you this, he's coming back. And I don't want to be one of those who's asleep with no oil. I want to be one of those who's productive, one who's aware, who's prayerful, who's in the word, who's staying strong in the Lord. And, and I would love one day, and I, and I hope I hear it, I hope you hear it, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ say, hey, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the house of the Lord and forever be with the Lord.